Now, I said that um, I became aware of this respiratory virus and that it was a virus of interest. I became aware in February 2020. In March 2020, it was declared a global pandemic. It first came onto the radar of public health officials and the World Health Organization in December 2019. So a good several months before it came into my brain, um, scientists were watching what was happening and going, this, number one, this virus replicates really fast. Number two, the infection is gnarly, like it is causing issues with humans and death with humans that we need to watch this thing and we need to control it. One of the um, most important things to do is to figure out the genome because we pretty much guarantee if we can't figure out the genome, the sequence, then it's going to be hard to develop tests and vaccines. I'm going to show you, I'm going to go back to that website that I showed you earlier and specifically look at this SARS-CoV-2 virus because if you scroll down on this page, they actually have the DNA sequence or the RNA sequence right here. They figured out which parts of the genome code for which proteins and what each of these chunks of the genome actually do. They even have the poly A tail at the end of this mRNA strand, which, or th this RNA strand, which awesome, right? The ribosome reads it if it has the bling that gets dressed up on, uh, you know what I'm trying to say. The virus has dressed up its RNA so that our cells, our ribosomes will read it. This is such a cool site because it links like the code and where it is in this strand with the actual proteins. Check it out. You can see up there, you can see the proteins, those, this piece of RNA codes for those spike proteins that allow the virus to get into our cell. Okay, so let's look at, dude, how are we going to sequence this stuff? How do, how'd, they do, how'd they do that? How'd they figure it out? What I have to tell you is that the process I'm going to describe was discovered in the 70s by a dude named, I can do this, um, come on now, Frederick. Frederick Sanger in 1977, discovered this process of um, how to sequence DNA. And I'm going to talk about sequencing DNA, but there's one, there's a way that we can go from RNA to DNA. And that's what they did with COVID and that, or the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And it requires a special enzyme called reverse transcriptase. I love it when words, we can figure it out just looking at this word. So reverse, backwards, transcript, that makes me think of RNA, transcription, DNA to RNA, reverse transcription, and then of course, thank you very much for adding the ACE on there, which tells us that that's an enzyme. Okay, nice. So I'm down with reverse transcriptase as an enzyme that I can remember what it's going to do. This was first. So they took reverse transcriptase, added a bunch of nucleotides, plus DNA nucleotides. So they took the genetics, the hereditary material out of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, added reverse transcriptase, and added DNA nucleotides, and voila, 
ended up with a strand of DNA that matched the RNA transcript. So this is the RNA material found in the virus. That's first. Now we're going to talk about how we sequence the DNA. Here's how it happens. First of all, you got to have a piece of DNA. Get enough DNA for four tubes. Hmm, interesting. And I'm going to draw you little tubes. And I'm drawing them this way on purpose because they're micropipette tubes. And I'm not kidding, folks. They're like this big, like maybe what is that, like an inch tall? And they are shaped like this. They're, they're shaped like little ice cream cones. And the amount of DNA, enough DNA that you need is like one drop. Like one drop of liquid goes in the bottom of this wild little tube. And that's enough. Okay, that's cool. <laughs> This process that we're going to describe also lets you amplify DNA. So if you have a sample of DNA and you know something about it, you can try primers to bind it and it will let you make jillions and jillions of copies this process. We're going to talk about that um, process later in more detail. Okay, so we have enough of the DNA for four tubes. Then we add... Um, we're going to add DNA polymerase. Now just stop a minute and think, why are we going to add DNA polymerase? What did DNA polymerase do in when we learned about it before? It's our main DNA replication enzyme. So if we have DNA polymerase in this mix, then we're going to be able to make copies of the DNA. The DNA polymerase will do that job. I'm going to tell you that this is a special DNA polymerase called TAC polymerase. And TAC, it's a special um, polymerase found in uh, Archaeans that live in... Um, hot springs, thermal hot springs. They first discovered this guy in the Yellowstone National Park in the hot springs. And this is significant because it functions at high temperatures. When you do this process, you have to take your DNA. Let's see here. We'll go a little purple. You have to denature the DNA with heat. And all that means is that you're gonna separate it into two strands. You're not gonna have a single, like one piece of DNA. You're gonna separate the double helix and you're gonna get um, just two strands, which that has to happen, right? In order for replication to happen, that has to happen. And remember, this is just the DNA that we created from the RNA found in the virus. Next thing we need to add is um, we need primers. Because remember, DNA polymerase can't get the job done unless it has a primer that binds to this single strand. So I'm just going to draw my little primer here. And once the primer binds, I'm going to not draw it like that. I'm going to draw it down here. You can figure out why that is. Once that primer binds, then DNA polymerase, in this case, the hot one, can come in and start making copies of the DNA. Once we have a copy, once we have double-stranded copies made, we can heat it up and cause denaturing. And then TAC polymerase can come in and do the job again, make another copy. Cool it down so TAC polymerase can do that work, heat it back up, denature it. Now we separate those all out again and TAC polymerase can come in and replicate again. 
this, you might look at this and be like, okay, this is just getting us a whole bunch of copies. And it is, except there's one other thing that we're going to add. And these are um, chain terminating nucleotides. So hopefully you're looking at this going, okay, dude, you've got the polymerase and the primers, but you also need nucleotides. And I'm like, oh, right, right. We gotta have nucleotides because we can't add DNA and make copies unless we have nucleotides in the mix. So these guys, these three ingredients are added to every single tube. That's awesome, with the DNA. And now we've got everything we need, except here's the coolest part. Oh my gosh, what color is this gonna be? going to be yellow because it's my favorite color. We add a chain terminating nucleotide to each tube. So in the first tube, we add chain terminating adenines. And in the second tube, we add chain terminating thymines and then chain terminating guanines and chain terminating cytosines. What in the world is a chain terminating nucleotide? Well, this was a really fun lecture to prepare for because I got to look up um, Legos and I have to find my Lego part picture. <laughs> Because this is what I think of when I think of chain terminating things. Nucleotides are like Legos, right? We just can stack them and build them and make giant stacks. A chain terminating nucleotide is like Lego number seven over here. Do you see this? Lego number seven has the bottom part. You can put, have you ever played with those kinds of Legos before? Like I wanna make them into roofs because you're not gonna add things on top of the roof. You can just have a flat roof. It's chain terminating because you aren't gonna be able to add anything else after that one goes in. When the chain terminating nucleotide gets added in to the replication process, the process stops, it's done, and you end up with a fragment of the DNA. A fragment of the DNA that you know ends in A. Dude, how weird is that? So you end up with in, just imagine this for a second. Imagine a, you get these strands of DNA of varying sizes because everywhere that there is an A, it added a chain terminator and it just stopped. Now, there's also regular A's in there. So it's a random draw the dice. It's a roll of the dice. You don't draw dice. You draw cards and you roll dice. And it's random both ways. So DNA polymerase is working in the A tube and pulls, okay, here's a T, I need to add an A, adds the A nucleotide. If it was a chain terminator, game over. DNA polymerase is like, well, it can't go on from here. Guess I'm gonna start a new one and gets working on some new ones. If it's a regular nucleotide, then it keeps going and it just is fine. And it ends up making all these fragments in the first tube that end with A. All these fragments in the second tube that end with T. All these fragments in the third tube that end with G. And the fragments in the fourth tube that end with C. Now, dude, you've got a whole bunch of fragments in a drop of liquid. You can't see doo-doo. What are you gonna doo-doo? Don't doo-doo because all you have to do is run it through a process, a technique called electrophoresis. I will write that down for you. Electro 
for rhesus to the rescue seriously <laughs> so you take your little drops of dna that you did a thing with them but you can't see what you did and then you run them through this process this right here is an agar 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 agaros that's what it is an agar agar i don't know how obviously i don't know how to pronounce this word but it's made out of gel and it's like seaweed gel and you make you put little holes little wells in the ends right here where this guy is putting her um that machine thing is going in she's dropping the drops of dna into holes in this gel and the electrophoresis machine sends an electric charge through the gel and the electric charge is it's negatively charged by the wells and it's positively charged at the end and dna has a negative charge so you run you drop all this negatively charged stuff in the well you run an electric current through and the positively charged dna particles move through the gel now oh my gracious you can actually visualize where the lines of dna like the molecules of dna spread themselves out through this gel and you can imagine if the wells are down here on this end and um actually it looks like it looks like the wells are up here and i should use you can kind of see them i don't know if you can see them but i can kind of see them right here and then this is the positive i mean the negative side where you put the dna in and then you run the current to the positive side and so all those little particles of dna are going to move this is why this lecture was so fun because i also got to look up um what are they called jungle gyms because <laughs> you know i had to have a visual for this the DNA molecules going through the gel, little ones are gonna go faster than big ones. Now imagine all these tiny humans have to race through this jungle gym and they have to race like NFL football players. Who's gonna win the race through the jungle gym, NFL football players or the tiny humans? Dude, tiny humans are going to go way faster through the juggle gym than the big NFL players. So you can actually end up concluding that the particles that move farther are smaller. They move farther and faster through the gel because they're smaller, they're smaller pieces. You can also conclude that we had the A column and the T column. So where the lines come out, we can actually read backwards and determine the sequence of the DNA. Once you know the DNA sequence, you can backward figure out the RNA sequence. This was really long, but we're gonna practice. And the next one, we're gonna look at, okay, what does that actually look like? So we'll have a quick review and then we'll keep going for our other types of um, biotech stuff related to COVID.